summer of 1969, and my mom, and my tutu lum, and my grandma Bechtel are sitting around the kitchen table in my mom's old school kitchen in Kahala. And tutu lum is showing how to make dim sum. So she's squeezing off little balls of the wonton dough, smashing them flat with the back of a cleaver, scraping them up. And then you take this uh, pork and shrimp and water chestnut filling and put it inside. And if you push it up on the sides, put it in this pan over here, because that's going to be a pork cash to steam it. And if you flatten it out and make a little hat out of it, put it over here, because that's going to be fried and will be a wonton. <laughs> and I'm seven years old, and I'm just getting back from the garden. They decided they wanted more green onions in the mix. And so I'm handing these green onions to my tutu lum, and she looks at me and she's like, Jan, that's my mom, has Kitty ever made a leg? And my mom said, no, I don't think so. So Tutu Lum says, okay, how about after these are popped, you and me, we go in the backyard, we'll make a lay. So I was excited. My family had moved to Hawaii in uh, 1965. We came on Boys Day with the fish flags flying. It was a two-year assignment for my father as a city planner, and we never left. I often accused them later of having moved as far away from the East Coast as they could get without leaving the United States. And it's funny because every other person that I'm related to, to this day, lives within about 100 miles of the tiny town of Hanover, Pennsylvania, where I was born. Gigi Lone was like our angel of how to live in Hawaii. Um, she was Hawaiian, Chinese, she was old even then. She had a beautiful wrinkly face and short white hair and just was always laughing and smiling. She taught my mom, they would cook together all the time. She was our neighbor. And um, they would make Cantonese food, um, sometimes using Hawaiian electric company recipes. You know, they would make those cookbooks. <laughs> Good ones even today, and there's an archive online. Um, and they would also use recipes from Chuchu Lum's husband, who actually um, owned a restaurant. And uh, she also taught my mom to make Hawaiian food. So they would make pokey. Um, we would gather limu at Kahala Beach, which you could back then. Uh, we would get kukui nuts from our neighbor's yard and roast them and grind up the inamona. And we used rock salt. And uh, they made la la. One time I came home and I even found my mom and my tutu lung in the backyard digging the inu. <laughs> she also had a lot of gardening advice. Um, my mom was complaining one day about the stand of banana trees in the backyard. They were like those big 40-foot kind, the giant ones, and they had not produced in like two years. And my mom was saying, eh, you know, I just don't know what to do. Despite the best advice of radio horticulturalist Dr. Horace Clay, and despite different types of fertilizer and watering, just nothing. Tutu Lum's like, oh, you know, I know what to do. She goes in the backyard, grabs a machete out of the shed, <laughs> waves it over her head, yelling at the trees, you know, you don't make bananas, we're gonna cut you down. <laughs> And that year we had 400 pounds of bananas and seven stalks, and those banana trees kept producing ever after. It was crazy. So when the dim sum were ready and they were sitting in the refrigerator, four hours, no less, that's what Tutu Lung says because otherwise they're going to be mushy and no good. She says, okay, we're ready. I got the needle and thread. You go get a lava lava off the line and meet me in the backyard. So I go run, and I grab one of my mom's pareas off the line, and I run into the backyard, and I'm waiting for her, and looking at the plumeria trees that are around. We had about 14 plumeria trees in our backyard. Um, pink ones, rainbow, like the little white poo shell ones that with the little tiny petals, and um, the big Samoan kind that smell fantastic, but don't make great lace because they go brown with too fast. And of course we have the classic, the yellow and white, what we call the graveyard plumeria. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> that's the one I'm standing next to when my tutu lemon comes up and she says, okay, perfect. She says, you know, put the, put the cloth under the tree. I'm gonna rest, you're gonna pick. But uh, first, tell me what you see, look at these flowers. So there's this big head of plumeria right in front of my face, and I'm only seven, so it's enormous. And all the trees are just in full bloom because it's summer. I'm like, okay, well I see some that are kind of floppy and old. She's like, mm -hmm. and I see some that are kind of not bloomed, like buds, and she's like, yep. And I see some that look really good, and she's like, yeah, and I see bees. She's like, okay, here's what you got to do. You got to reach real careful to the base of the good flower. Keep it off. Don't break off the buds, and if the old floppy ones fall off, that's okay. And if you're gentle, the bees will leave you alone. Like, okay, so I start picking. So pick, 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 and she said, I'm going to put it in this paper sack. 
So I'm going, putting them in the sack. It's a big head of flowers, and I'm going real slow, and I get about three quarters of the way across. And she's like, okay, stop. I'm like, oh, is this enough flowers? And she's like, no, you're going to need like two or three more heads. Uh, but don't take it all. I'm like, how come? And she says, well, just whatever you do, just, whether you're leaving it for other people or just leaving it for the bees, just never take it all. Leave some for everybody else. I'm like, okay. So I move on to the next one and the next one. And pretty soon, I have a nice big bag of flowers and I jump in at two two lumps feet. And she's like, okay, let's make this light. So she shows me how to pick off the, um, the nubbin from the base of the plumeria and like uh, put the thread through it and tie a knot so now the rest of the flowers won't slide off the back end of the leg. And then one by one, spear in place, spear and put them down. Every now and then like grab them and just pull them just a little bit to make them nice and tight, but not so much that you would damage the flowers. And really quickly, we had a beautiful leg. She tied the knot, trimmed it off, and I was about to excitedly put it on my, on my own neck and she's like, oh, <laughs> what? And she said, oh, you know, you can make a lay for yourself, but mostly we're going to make these things to give away. And I was like, okay, great. She said, yeah, you know what? Give that one to your mom right now. Just run because she's going to be really happy to get it. So I race down into the kitchen. I'm like, mom, mom, here's your leg. And I plop it around her neck, give her a big kiss, the way Tutu Lum showed me, and how to keep it a little bit off the back of her neck so the heat from her neck won't make it floppy too soon. And if you've never had a fresh plumeria lay dumped around your neck, it's like, it's an amazing experience. It's, it's like the humblest and cheapest of the lay flowers, but it's cold and creamy and heavy and smells fantastic. And uh, I just realized very quickly that a lay has special power to elevate any situation. It can make a happy person feel awesome, and it can even make a sad person feel a little better. And after this, I became Tutu Lum's like apprentice. <laughs> so uh, we would gather together and, um, and get flowers from our neighbors, get flowers from our friends. Uh, we would get actual lay needles, which you can get at uh, any long struck store. You just have to ask. They're about nine inches long, and they're great for handling um, delicate flowers. And when Tutu Lum died, it left a big hole in our hearts. But I like to think that she lives on in the teaching that she did while she was here. And I was thinking about her lately because um, my, my friend Lev passed away kind of unexpectedly in Oregon. And um, he and Rose, his wife, had actually met in a house we all shared in, in Manoa when we were in college. And um, they had gotten married at the uh, Waikiki Aquarium, moved to Oregon, and enjoyed many years of, of marital bliss. But then he became ill and more and more frail. And it wasn't a shock, but it was still unexpected when he died. And I knew that I wasn't going to be able to go to the um, services, which were planned at a remote campsite along the Klamath River in Oregon. Um, so I sort of called on Tutu Lum's memory to think, well, what kind of lay can I give that would, that would help? And what I came up with was um, a haku head lay for my friend Rose that was made out of um, salmon-colored roses, so roses for Rose, Salmon for Oregon, <laughs> and, uh, and fern, baby's breath. And then for Lev, I actually purchased from my florist, Miley Lay from Hilo. And both of those lay uh, actually ended up floating down the Klamath River with Lev's remains. Um, and I know that my Tutu Lum would be really happy that I'm here telling you this story and that you're learning about her three rules of life. Um, choose carefully, handle gently, and leave some for everybody else. <laughs> But I know that she'd say, most of all, no matter who you are or where you are, no matter what your joys or blessings or sorrow, go make a lay. Yeah.